All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our seminar today. Today's seminar is a joint collaboration between the PNNL WSU Advanced Grid Institute, uh, WSU Energy Systems Innovation Center, and the US India Collaborative for Smart Distribution System with Storage, or UI Assist. And so uh, we appreciate those that are here participating. I wanted to share just a little bit of information and I'll put, once we get started, I'll put some of these links in the, um, in the chat so you'll have those. So um, first of all, uh, related to UI Assist, um, uh, this is the project team uh, with UI Assist, which is our, uh, uh, our normal seminar this morning is our UI Assist seminar and it's a joint DOE, uh, Government of India DST project, and you see many of the participants here. Uh, we also have the Advanced Grid Institute, um, which is a partnership between PNNL and WSU. And in addition to this webinar, we also have webinars um, on the 6th and 27th of April on some different topics that you're welcome to join. And we'll send these slides out as well. And then ESIC uh, Energy Systems Innovation Center is also has webinars weekly and also participates in PCIRC as well as the other webinars. So um, these are some links and I'll put them in the chat so you can learn more about these groups. And I think I divided my UI Assist slide, but this is the UI Assist um, link if you want to learn more about, about that project. So um, with that in mind, um, I wanted to just welcome everybody here today and I'd like to uh, introduce our speakers um, and uh, we appreciate them uh, taking time to present to us and uh, we have a, a big audience today so we're excited. Um, one thing as we get started just to let everyone know um, because we have a big crowd we have all this uh, unless you're speaking you're are muted so we really would like for you to use the chat and since we have three speakers, they can also dialogue when they're not speaking. Um, so please feel free to put questions in the chat and then we will open it up after about 30 minutes for Q&A. And, and um, we can, uh, you can raise your hand and or put it in the chat. We'll kind of see how that goes and moving forward. And we will also put some key links in the chat so you will have those. So, um, let me introduce our three speakers. Uh, Dr. Anu Anaswamy is founder and director of the Adapt Active Adaptive Control Laboratory in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at MIT. Her research interests span adaptive control theory and applications to aerospace, automotive, and propulsion systems, as well as cyber physical systems, such as smart cities, smart grids, smart infrastructures, her research team of 15 students and postdocs is supported by the U.S. Air Force Research Laboratory, U.S. Department of Energy, Boeing, Ford, MIT Alliance, and NSF. She's received best papers um, in the uh, awards and uh, is a, P, uh, a Presidential Young Investigator Award from NSF and author of a graduate textbook on adaptive control, co-editor of Vision Documents on Smart Grid, and also is a fellow of IEEE and IFAC and is currently the president of the Control Systems Society and as a past president of IEEE PES, I appreciate her taking time with us because that's a very busy position. Uh, our second speaker is Dr. Anjan Bose, who's a Regent Professor and Distinguished Professor of Electric Power Engineering at Washington State University in Pullman, Washington, where he served as Dean from 1998 to 2005. He also was senior advisor on the electric power grid during the Obama administration for the U.S. Department of Energy. Um, he's a leading researcher in operation and, and control of the electric power grid, and he's worked in the industry as well as academics for over 40 years. He received all his degrees, his bachelor's, master's, and PhD at IIT Kaiapur and um, the University of California, Berkeley and Iowa State University and is a member of the National Academy of Engineering and a foreign fellow of the Indian National Academy and fellow of the IEEE. He's also a member of the Chinese Academy of Engineering. As many different activities, he was appointed to the governor, 
governors by the governor to the board of directors for the Washington Technology Center and has been in many commit committees, including the one that we'll be talking about today. Our third uh, speaker is Jeff Daigle, and I have the opportunity to work with Jeff through the Advanced Grid Institute. And Jeff uh, works at Pacific Northwest National Lab or PNNO in Richland, which is operated by Battelle for the Department of Energy. And he's worked there since 1989. He's also a Coug WSU Coug alum and he, um, go Cougs, right? Um, during his time, he le has led many projects. He is a, a leader in the North American Synchrophaser Institute in initiative, NASPI, and also works with DOE Grid Modernization Laboratory Consortium um, and has led a lot of different projects. And he was named, he is one of the inaugural with Dr. Bose, the inaugural direct co-directors of the Advanced Grid Institute. And he's also been involved in several other reports in addition to this one, including the 2003 blackout, as well as looking at resiliency and other activities across the board. So I and I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Noel Schultz and I'm the Schweitzer Chair in Electrical Engineering at uh, WSU Pullman and a co-director with Jeff Daigle and also work with both Anjan and Anu it with our UISS. So it's a small world in the power community. So now I'm going to uh, try to share my slides and turn it over to our speakers to talk about uh, the topic you're all here to learn about and uh, we'll go from there. So remember put it in the chat and let's see if this we can get our technology to work. And Anu are you going first? No, I'm going first, no. So I'm requesting control right now. OK, you got it. OK, great. So uh, thank you very much for the introductions and uh, um, appreciate everybody's uh, attendance here today. So how do I advance the slides? I'm hitting page, there we go. So um, uh, we're here today to talk about the report of the future of electric power in the US and uh, representing, let's see, I'm not, my page down isn't working. So how does this work? I, I'm not sure if I did that or, or, or somebody else, but um, so um, Anu Anjan and I are part of a committee of um, folks that were um, uh, led by Granger Morgan from Carnegie Mellon University. And so the committee was chosen uh, based on different aspects of understanding the electric power. Um, there are some folks, um, uh, you know, on the um, uh, committee that were, uh, you know, kind of part of the electric power industry. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not doing that on the screen. I'm not sure uh, what, what's happening there. Um, and so in addition to uh, um, folks on the, uh, you know that that represent uh, uh, different aspects of uh, electric power industry. We also had folks that were um, uh, looking at different aspects of of either um, policy related to uh, regulatory aspects or uh, end use uh, uh, types of uh, issues as well. So no, you'll have to advance the slides because when I hit page down, nothing nothing works for me. The next slide, please. So the report that we're talking about today, um, there's a, a seven chapters. So we start with framing the issues. Uh, then we talk about drivers of change, uh, legal and regulatory issues, uh, investment in electric power innovation or, or research and development. Um, then we get into technologies that uh, will enhance the future grid. Um, uh, chapter six is on uh, secure and resilient power systems. And then we summarize all of the recommendations in uh, chapter seven. Next slide, please. So one of the things that we uh, talk about, uh, next slide. One of the things that we talk about in the report is that we are not projecting the, uh, we're predicting what the future of the grid will be uh, decades into the future. Uh, we do point out in the report that attempts that have been made in the past to try to project the future grid are often wildly incorrect, you know, because it's hard to uh, predict uh, technology 
uh, transformation that could really be disruptive in the sense of uh, changes in the way that we generate or consume electricity. Um, you know, just thinking about some of the underlying support technologies like communications, if you compare what we're doing today with the situation um, uh, 20 or 30 years ago, it would have been really difficult to predict uh, 2021 from that um, uh, time frame. So when we're projecting forward to the years, you know, 2040 or 2050 and, and some of the challenges that the electricity infrastructure and the landscape will face, we realized that it was not um, um, a good idea to try to predict the future, but we can um, really look at uh, key drivers of change and and then some of the uh, things how that will affect engineering trade-offs associated with our uh, future grid and so this diagram here is intended to show how these uh, different aspects of the grid uh, can can balance out and trade off with each other so um, uh, safety and security are things that we do not intentionally uh, compromise we we try to strive to to have a safe and secure uh, power grid at all times but the other things in terms of reliability and resilience and affordability and equity and sustainability and clean power, those are fundamentally engineering trade-offs. And so we try to balance those attributes, but we recognize that uh, oftentimes uh, those, those are key trade-offs that you need to pay attention to and, and, and try to keep those in balance. Next slide, please. So uh, as we as the committee was working on this report, we uh, uh, worked on it for uh, almost two years and uh, fortunately we had a chance to have some face to face uh, meetings and workshops before uh, we started to get uh, quarantined last year. And uh, so we finished the, the document, um, you know, with with uh, remote uh, participation through Zoom and other uh, formats. But uh, but the good news is we did have some uh, opportunity for a couple of workshops one in November of 2019 and the other one in February of 2020. And so these uh, uh, workshop reports complement or feed into the actual uh, committee report as well. And they're available and have been widely viewed. Uh, next slide, please. So um, sort of digging in. So chapter one I previously mentioned was sort of setting the context. Chapter two is the drivers of change that I mentioned earlier. And so we came up with seven key drivers of change. Uh, one is that uh, customers are going to require uh, electricity in sort of um, um, different ways that we've had in the past. So one example is uh, electrification of transportation. That's going to have some profound impacts. We're going to see electrification of um, in, in item two, um, you know, some heavy industry and other things that we have a lot of primary energy that can um, we can help decarbonize the energy landscape by electrification of more of those types of end uses. Uh, three is we're continuing to see many more innovations at the grid edge, advanced computing and smart grid technologies and power electronics and those types of things continue to evolve and we see acceleration of that as well as for the uh, increased use of uh, things like wind and solar we want to extract as much energy out of those resources as we can when they're available, but they're fundamentally less dispatchable than other types of energy generation. And so uh, we're going to have to figure out our flexibility through some other means. Uh, five is uh, reducing social inequities. So, uh, for example, relating to um, a local PV, for example, uh, we wouldn't want to inadvertently set in motion a situation where people that can't afford distributed energy resources um, benefit at the expense of people that can't afford to make those capital investments. And so really looking at those uh, social inequities across the society. Uh, five is, uh, excuse me, I already talked about that. Six is the um, uh, jobs as it relates to this clean energy revolution. And as we migrate uh, into these uh, uh, areas. And then seven, we talked about the globalization of supply chains and the importance of that. So the next slide, please. So chapter three focuses on uh, legal and regulatory issues. And so if, why don't we, I didn't realize this slide build, so why don't we click a few more times. Um, okay, one more, that's it. So um, on, on the legal and regulatory issues, uh, there's a lot of, of interesting uh, constraints that we have in the United States as it relates to transmission is primarily regulated at the federal level with FERC and the, the states get involved with um, 
um, the, the, more of the retail side or distribution, uh, transmission line siting is uh, continues to be a problem. And as we need to build in the future more transmission to get access to these renewables that may be remotely located, uh, really getting into um, new and better ways of approaching some of these uh, regulatory constraints is uh, a lot of what this uh, uh, report addresses and chapter three really digs into that. And if you uh, go to the next slide, no, and unfortunately this is another build one. So why don't we just click through a few more times. I'll tell you when to stop. Uh, one more. OK, that's good. So um, this is intended to show and I think everybody that's involved in the electricity uh, business knows this, that the system is extremely and extraordinarily complex. When you talk about the power system in the United States, well, it, it varies a lot depending on where you are and, and the nature of how the state has uh, deregulated, whether or not you're in an um, independent system operator footprint, um, the degree to the extent that the markets have been uh, deregulated and even comparing the nature of deregulated markets, for example, the difference between Texas and PGM, it's very significant differences. And so that's also recognized in the report that when you talk about the grid and um, the uh, uh, the nature of the grid, it depends on exactly where, where you're talking about and kind of what's going on in that local area. Uh, next slide. So we do have some specific recommendations. So uh, recommendation 3.3 .3 is on um, transmission planning and uh, the need to do uh, regional transmission planning. Uh, next slide. Uh, chapter uh, recommendation 3.11 uh, talks about innovations for um, how do we get the, the distribution system to um, have more deployment of DER and have that integrated into the grid. There needs to be uh, uh, more of this connection between distribution and transmission and and that can be addressed uh, you know, more effectively with getting state regulators working more closely with the, uh, the system as it evolves. Next slide. And then uh, uh, a few more, click two more times. Uh, so we have three more recommendations on um, other regulations and incentives that we can um, um, improve the way that FERC um, works. Specifically, the, some of these relate to the gas uh, the natural gas side of things and the fact that there there is no um, equivalent regulation for how the gas industry is regulated as it relates to the electric industry and that does uh, create some challenges. We saw some of that in Texas for example last month but there um, there are some very specific and tangible things that we um, uh, see with respect to you know cybersecurity and, and natural gas and other uh, uh, ways that we can incentivize some of these advancements um, that we're uh, that we're looking at uh, deploying. Um, so next slide. So chapter four talks about our investment in uh, electricity R&D and uh, what uh, what's going on in that space. And so if you click to the next slide, Noel, um, the uh, what, what we looked at were some trends in terms of spending at the federal level, at the national level, and, and then also including what uh, industry invests in R&D. And we look at the trends in the United States in terms of um, uh, research and development spending over time and then contrast that with um, other countries. Uh, not every country is, is reflected on here. Um, you know, China, for example, we don't have uh, reliable data on on exactly what they're spending on R&D, but we know it's a lot. Um, but you can you can clearly see on the trend here that the United States is 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 a um, the only one on this these plots that are going down over time. And uh, and then compared to um, if we if we look at it in terms of just raw funding or as a fraction of um, gross domestic product, for example, it's very low compared to other countries. And so we use some of this data in chapter four to make the case to Congress that we need to increase the spending of research and development in in the United States on some of these topics. Uh, next slide. And this plot uh, shows specifically a trend of what what the US is spending on research and development billions of dollars over time. The uptick there that you see in 2009 was the Recovery Act. Um, 
in the in the funding that was allocated to that. And some of those dots um, at the end there represent what uh, uh, different organizations project uh, would be good targets to have. So you can see we really are, you know, all of the data shows that the United States is under investing in research and development. And so this report is intending to to highlight that and make recommendations to Congress to boost the the budgets of DOE and NSF and other organizations. Uh, next slide. So, um, so specific recommendations associated with that. Most of these are are really directed to Congress, but uh, hopefully uh, there's other good things here that um, uh, other parties can gain benefit from that. So, uh, what I'd like to do now is turn the reins over to Anu, who will talk about uh, technologies. Thanks, Jeff. Okay, if we could go to the next slide, please. Okay, so what I would like to focus on are the next two chapters, which uh, primarily talk about uh, the pivotal technologies that uh, we need to examine. As uh, Jeff mentioned, there are a number of drivers that basically bring us to this conversation. And we are not here to predict the future with a crystal ball, but more importantly, examine no matter what version of the future there may be, what are the technologies that uh, we need to focus on to ensure the uh, uh, goals of the future power grid. So um, much of what is listed in here basically addresses um, uh, that process of uh, realizing our target. And so these are the specific uh, topics, and this is a summary of what's there in Chapter 5. I would encourage you strongly to really read the report to get the breadth and depth of it. Um, clean generation is what we start out with, and so as uh, Jeff mentioned, a good bit of wind and solar generation is uh, really where there's been a lot of exponential growth, and so what we would like to do is to understand how to make that into utility scale and also address uh, the dispatchability aspect of it. And uh, concomitant with that, we really need advances in energy storage, um, and the report discusses that as well. And in order to ensure that there is the right interface between these different new sources of generation and the grid, you need power electronics, uh, and the advances there are going to be uh, pivotal in really realizing the, the different versions of the future power grid. Now, all of this in some sense addresses the physical layer and the advances that need to happen in hardware and associated with all of these things is an information layer and the rest of the uh, technologies that are addressed in chapter five talk about that. So we need advances in communications and 5G and more. And the grid management system at a systems level needs to start to interconnect all of these things to make sure that the relevant information arrives quickly at the relevant uh, recipient in the right manner. And so distributed energy resources, microgrids, EVs are all agents that help us um, uh, uh, generate new sources of information that the grid management system has to uh, manage. So sensing, monitoring are important, standards and regulation are, are important in this context, and um, electricity markets is really the agency by which these uh, set points um, are enabled at different parts of the grid, and so how do you make sure that the market structure is concomitantly progressing and, uh, uh, and different mechanisms are in place in order to have the uh, other technologies stitched together and reach the goal. So, and again, as these uh, uh, number of agents increase beyond a few thousands to a few hundreds of thousands and millions, we really need to be able to coordinate, coordinate them properly, ensure that data which sit, sit behind different ownership boundaries are all uh, appropriately available. How do you make sure that that this, these control technologies support the appropriate processing of information? And finally, if we really want to manage all of these millions of active nodes, we need to have some level of ultra automation. So everything has to fit together properly. And, and uh, Anjan will talk more about the last bullet of what are the challenges involved in making sure that these uh, future power grids uh, will indeed behave the way we would like them to. Um, next slide. So. Again, this is a big list, and I just want to sort of make only one point in here, um, which is that the key takeaway is that 
we are not looking at shallow decarbonization. We are looking at deep decarbonization. So that's on the one hand, and that's the push, if you will. And the pull is to make sure that resilience and reliability of the power grid is managed, because we're not just talking about an internet kind of a large scale system, but the power grid, which has expl a, a, a explicit physics that has to be honored and a public good that has to be met. And so how do you make sure that this trade off between this push and pull is managed and the bullets that are on the right side are basically underscoring as to how to manage this this interface and this trade off between the two, because it is at the grid edge in any version of the future that the grid might evolve in. The grid edge is certainly going to see a lot of uh, uh, changes of, uh, and, and it will be highly distributed and decentralized because PVs, the rooftop solars are going to be everywhere. EVs are going to be everywhere. And therefore, that grid edge has to be appropriately managed. And so as these new generation and storage and flexible loads basically keep popping up, how do you make sure that these uh, pieces of uh, assets are appropriately managed? And that really is the um, uh, message that this chapter is trying to uh, get across. Next slide. So the recommendations basically are uh, consistent with this. And again, uh, I want to only spend about 10 seconds on this, that first let's pay attention to these uh, hardware technologies and the government and industry has to basically provide the appropriate funding mechanisms. And in addition to whatever happens in the physical layer, we need to make sure that the information layer sees appropriate support. And how do you make sure that this happens so that the resilience is maintained? And all of this is R&D, but in order to really uh, have uh, uh, development and deployment, workforce of the future has to be appropriately nurtured, and that's the last recommendation. Next slide. So moving on, chapters, and you can hit a few returns, if you will. Um, like I said, sorry, go back. <laughs> yes, thank you. So um, we singled out this particular technology because the new challenge that is precipitated because of the highly changing nature of the uh, power grid is that resilience uh, has to be ensured, security has to be ensured because these assets are coming from heterogeneous sources and with explicit bound ownership boundaries. And so in order to make sure when you open up the grid from a few thousands to few hundreds of thousands and billions, security has to be maintained. Physical disruptions are important uh, to be to recognize and accommodated, but cyber disruptions are new uh, anomalies that enter the picture and it completely changes the nature of things. And as Jeff mentioned, we need to do all of these things, keeping in mind that equity considerations are met. And so the points that this uh, chapter addresses basically to underscore this challenge. And in order to do that, so many different things have to be in place. You have to have a system centric approach rather than a component centric approach. And all of the other recommendations that we mentioned earlier in terms of not only making sure that uh, technology uh, advances are supported at the physical layer and information layer that you also need to have appropriate training and retraining of the workforce. And so these things are uh, important uh, uh, considerations that were underscored in, the, in this particular chapter. Next slide. And the recommendations that are listed are all basically, again, can be broadly cap categorized into these headings, that there's research and um, uh, workforce development, and um, all of these uh, sources of knowledge and understanding and, and uh, technologies have to be appropriately shared between uh, different agencies so that um, there's a synergy and, and efficient advancement uh, of the overall uh, power grid landscape. And I believe that is the end of my um, uh, presentation. And I think, let me, if you could hit the next return and go to the next line. Oh, yes. Um, the last point is that, um, and we, we, we cannot say this enough, that in addition, in order to make sure that it's not just research that progresses and the implementation and deployment are facilitated, um, standards have to be paid attention to and that these are the next uh, set of recommendations in here and at the end of the day all of this really uh, points uh, uh, the, uh, the the vector to ensuring that national security has to be maintained and this cannot happen just by counting on utilities which have been essentially the um, agencies that have been taking care of the grid edge, but multiple other processes have to be int introduced in place in order to ensure that resilience requirements are maintained at the distribution level, because some of these things happen not at the federal level, but the state and local level, and the recommendations listed in here basically take care of that. 
So with that, Anjan, it's all yours. Next slide. Anjan, you're on mute. Sorry, um, uh, since the first two speakers have already talked about all the chapters, you're probably wondering what I'm going to talk about. Um, and uh, but there's a theme that uh, kind of weaves through all the chapters, and that has to do with architecture. Now, this is a relatively new term in power engineering, but uh, that mainly because uh, we have always assumed that the generation transmission distribution architecture that we have known for decades uh, was going to stay the same way uh, for forever. And obviously it's going to be changing. Uh, the biggest change being that the, that, uh, the pa distribution is no longer going to be passive and uh, um, much of the generation, the DGs are going to move to the, uh, the distribution side. There's going to be also uh, active loads and load participation in uh, controlling the uh, controlling the grid. So we started looking at the uh, at this architecture, and this has been written about by many people. Um, in as three different layers, the bottom layer in that picture that you're seeing is the physical layer. That's the generation transmission distribution, which is now being overlaid more and more with an ICT layer, the information communication system, which includes all of the uh, communications, the computers, the controls, the microprocessor based uh, relays, the whole bit uh, that controls the the physical layer. And the one that we uh, don't necessarily always talk about, at least not in, in, in uh, at the university classes that we teach, is the organizational layer, which has to do with who owns what, who regulates what, what are the regulations, and we realize that the architecture is very much impacted by that organization layer or the regulations, policies, and so on. Just think about the fact that every state has a different uh, vision of when they're going to co completely decarbonize, different schedules, different ways, and so on. And that obviously is going to impact the way uh, we uh, operate and plan the grid. Next slide, please. The, uh, so so the, the, how are these things going to come about? Well, um, you know, the, the, the report has a several of these figures in there, which shows on one axis here, the bottom axis is the more electrification that might occur because of transportation going electrical and so on. And uh, uh, with the idea that if electrical goes completely green, that would be good to have all the cars running on electricity. Uh, on the vertical axis here, we're talking about uh, uh, how uh, the whole thing is going to be controlled out. You know, we normally think of control centers controlling all of the grid, um, a whole bunch of them, and uh, and then all the data somehow gets accumulated at the control center. Uh, but as we go along with the numbers of entities that we are going to have to control, you know, think of all the inverters that are going to be on the system, all the way down to the distribution and, and customer level. Um, it's going to get more and more automatic and more and more distributed. So it's more distributed as you go up. The, the point of this thing is that uh, there are many axes you can draw and these uh, the architecture will evolve differently in different parts of the country. Right. And just like today, you know, we don't even have fully, uh, we still have vertically integrated utilities in the US. Uh, 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 and so uh, as these architectures change, we're going to get a whole bunch of different ones. And this is why we did not try to say that the US is going to have this particular architecture in the future. Next slide, please. So, um, you know, what do we do? do that's going to be effective? And that's the bigger question. You know, we have to, as engineers, we have to plan the grid. We have to do the planning of the operations. Then we have to operate the grid. We have to train the operators. And all of this, let me tell you, 
all of this requires a huge amount of simulation because there is no way to do any of these analytical things without simulation. The grid, there is only one grid and that runs 24 seven and you can't shut it off to try things. And so the, be the only way we know how to do this is, uh, is simulation. And the question is, are the simulation tools that we have today adequate for this evolving architecture uh, that's going to happen? And how are we going to look at possible architectures if we can't simulate them? So we need to step up a lot for uh, to be able to do these modeling and simulation of possible architectures just to see what will happen. Um, now, um, what that means is that all these things have to be co-simulated. Nowadays, if you think of how you do things, you know, we, we do the bulk power system with one set of uh, tools. We did the production costing with another set of tools. We did, uh, we do trend distribution things with another set of tools and very cell. And we have great difficulty putting in all the uh, computers and communication delays and all of those kinds of things. So co-simulation is the word that is being used now. But what that means is that the, all these different tools have to be able to talk to each other. And we call this being compatible. So uh, uh, these tools have to be compatible with each other, which means that they will have to uh, follow certain standards of databases, of storage, of uh, manipulation of the software, and, and so on. So the next slide, please. So that comes to the recommendations, and there's only a few recommendations here. One recommendation is that there needs to be a, a sustained collaboration between national labs, academia, utilities, and vendors, that is software vendors, to be able to come up with intercompatible simulation tools. That is, they have to work together to set the standards to be able to have this ability to go back and forth. There's, uh, there's a lot of talk about open uh, software, uh, open source software, and that's fine, but we don't think that, uh, that that's going to be the answer to everything with uh, because we've been de depending for at least 60 years for on vendors to come up with these software tools. Um, and then, but the other thing is that as the new technology is developed, these the models and simulations of these technologies must be available to everybody. Uh, there has been a tendency that you develop a new box of some kind that does something and, and it's proprietary and nobody knows what it does. And the question, the thing is that that can't be allowed and the regulators will have to step in and say that, look, if you're going to put this on the, <laughs> on the grid, it's got to be able to be simulated by the people who are going to use it. And uh, uh, so, and then finally, um, it, uh, the, these things, you know, one of the big issues today is suppose you change uh, the grid in some big and intensive way. Um, for example, there has been uh, proposals of doing a, either AC transmission overlay for the whole country or a DC transmission overlay of the whole country. We don't have the tools to study that. Uh, all the way down to the distribution level when 50 or uh, more percentage of the of the generation is going to be on the distribution side. So these kinds of tools have to be, uh, but tools won't be enough. We'll have to be able to do some large level field demonstrations. For example, like if you're going to interconnect um, uh, Texas with uh, uh, with either of the big grids, in, you know, you can do as much simulation as you want, but finally you'll have to put in a couple of connections and see what the hell happens. Okay, last slide, please. Okay, so going back to, I, I'm just uh, circling back to where Jeff started. Um, there's going to be new technologies, new legal and regulatory frameworks, uh, uh, and uh, then some insights from how this changes the community itself. There's been a lot of talk about electric electricity equity, um, uh, 
and so on. And so, uh, and finally, I'll end with the last uh, slide, which was also something that uh, Jeff used. Next slide, please. Uh, okay, you remember this slide, it's a balance between clean power going green, uh, going decarbonization, but not losing sight of reliability and resilience. We can't do it without uh, reliability and resilience. And uh, and this, this, this is this is a real tough one for engineers because it's one thing to decarbonize, another thing to make sure that everything uh, that you don't have these rolling blackouts that we've had in California and Texas now. Um, and then, of course, uh, the affordability and equity is always out there. So I'll stop there, and I think we have a few minutes for questions. Great, thank you so much for that, and. Um... I don't know if there's a, is that the end of the presentation? Yes. Okay, so I'm going to, uh, for now I'll stop sharing. If someone asks about a certain slide, we can uh, go back to that slide. So, um, so, uh, so no, I think Jeff- no, What I'd, like, what I'd like to do though is, is maybe address a question that just popped into the chat while we're, um, other people are typing in questions. Um, we, we, we didn't really talk about Texas in this presentation. Um, now, at the, I was a little rushed at the beginning because uh, the intros, um, I guess, with uh, all these accomplishments of Anu and, and Anjan are so uh, lengthy that it took a long time to go through these uh, introductions. But uh, so, so I felt like we were running behind schedule and I wanted to catch up. But one, one thing I neglected is that um, there have been other National Academies reports written recently on uh, other topics related to uh, security of the grid. There's there's one on terrorism, there's one on resilience. And in particular, the resilience report from 2017 really gets into topics relating to how can we ensure or improve the resilience of the grid. This report that we're briefing today, the 2021 report, uh, yes, resilience is included. It's one of these attributes. It, it's part of the scale that Anjan showed at the end um we don't ignore resilience and and uh, it's in there but we don't really focus in on it as much we kind of reference that 2017 report quite a bit when we mention resilience so in my in my way of thinking what what we saw with the events of ERCOT um, last month were really more of a generation adequacy problem you know it wasn't a lot of people and again there's been a lot talked about in the last month and the investigation is still early. There's still a lot to be learned uh, about what exactly went wrong. Um, you know, some people are sort of blaming that it's energy only markets and gee, if they only had a capacity market, that would have helped. Other people are, are looking at the fact that the uh, um, the deregulation has uh, created uh, uh, some lack of incentives for people to really invest in winterization and and so even though there were winterization requirements the generator operators had to comply with and report you know annually to the texas uh, public utility commission that they they were ready to go and winterized you know there's people criticizing that you know that wasn't sufficient and things like that so there's a lot of those types of of issues um that that relate to Texas that this report doesn't really address directly, you know, kind of indirectly. We talked we talked around some of these issues, um, but we, um, you know, in terms of of the the, the questions, um, you know, associated with ERCOT and if we had ERCOT or excuse me, the Texas problems, which which by the way are bigger than Texas. We had rolling blackouts in other places in Eastern interconnection as well as a result of that same storm. So it wasn't all just about Texas. Texas just had it worse than anybody else. Um, but, you know, had that event occurred before we were done with the report, maybe we probably would have said a little bit more about ensuring generation adequacy. Um, you know, so, so you know, I do think that we might have tweaked uh, some of what we wrote about um, it, had we had that um, information. But we did, we did very clearly in the report make the comment that that there's nobody in charge. You know, that's that's one of the challenges with the grid that we have in the U.S. today, is it's very fractured and and you know disaggregated and you know depending on which part of the country you're in, you know the planning process, you might be relying on a market to give you the uh, uh, capacity that you're you're needing in the future, and you know that's different than a sort of a planning process where you're really 
deliberately forecasting out and, and looking at these these issues. So um, I'll, I'll wrap up that comment real quick with just um, the fact that there, if you look at the situation in Texas before the storm, it looked like they had uh, plenty of reserve margin. Um, you know, when NERC does their annual uh, adequacy reports to the regions, you know, they, they sort of flag when a region looks like they have uh, a, a lean uh, reserve margin. But, you know, Texas wasn't raising any alarm bills before the storm. Um, they have a very nice diversified generation portfolio. You know, they're not just relying on wind and solar like some of the news outlets would have you believe. They had, they had wind, very little solar, but they have significant amount of wind there. But they also have a lot of natural gas. They have some coal, they have some nuclear. All of those generation sources were affected on the same day. And, and nobody really um, predicted that that was a likely uh, outcome. So, um, so I, I'm not sure how much we would have really written differently if, if this report was coming out several months from now with the benefit of what happened last month. Thanks, Jeff. And I put the link to the resilience report in the chat um, so people would have that reference if they wanted to learn more about what you said there. So uh, I don't know, Anu or Anjan, do you want to add any? I think Jeff answered a bunch of the different questions that are already in the chat. Um, I, I can add just one more point to what Jeff uh, said. Um, in the architecture slide that Anjan talked about, we there, were, there is an explicit mention of interdependence with other infrastructure. So that is something we discussed at length. Um, because the uh, Texas incident um, was indeed a perfect storm uh, where both the natural gas elements as well as the um, uh, grid elements were affected by the extreme weather. So that in turn says that you really need to these infrastructures to work in consonance and have better alignment so that that interdependence can be a beneficial one rather than a deleterious one. And we that architecture slide speaks to that and other parts of the report. And, and I guess while we're waiting for more questions to come in, I just want to make one other comment to uh, uh, Ryle's question about uh, the, the previous events. You know, there is a um, Texas got below freezing in 1989 and, and 2011. Um, so yeah, the last month isn't the first time this happened, uh, but it is hard to winterize power plants when they're not designed to operate in cold temperatures. You know, essentially these power plants are outdoor facilities. And, you know, so building a power facility in Texas where you don't normally get below freezing temperature, it's completely different than building this similar power plant in Minnesota, you know, where, where you Put it indoors basically um, and so you you know the winterization techniques that you need to do to make sure that your water supplies and, and things associated with the cold side of the of the balance of plant um, are properly winterized are, are challenging and what may work in 20 degrees may fail in 10 degrees and these are fahrenheit you know so 10 degrees fahrenheit and 20 degrees fahrenheit it's a significant difference in terms of the likelihood of, of your winterization methods working. And, and that's what they faced last month was 10 degrees, 2011 was 20 degrees, right? So that, that kind of gives you a feel for how much more significant the event was. Um, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to suggest that they could, could have, you know, they should have done a better job of being prepared and ready to go, I, you know, uh, but I just want to put it in context that it was, much more um, severe than they had experienced in the past. Maybe I can add uh, uh, to what Jeff just said about resiliency. Um, you know, uh, uh, people, the researchers uh, uh, have usually taken resiliency to be some sort of a new feature that uh, needs to be mathematically described. Uh, but the reality is that uh, much of resiliency is essentially hardening what is there. Just like Jeff said, people know how to winterize. It costs money to do it and it costs, uh, uh, you know, you have to do the engineering, you have to do the things we know how to do it. Uh, similarly for cybersecurity, uh, much of the cybersecurity has to do with processes and uh, uh, and 
hardening from us from a uh, uh, software computer point of view of practices that are already there. I mean, yes, we are going to put in new computers and new cybersecurity software and so on, but nothing will happen until we change the way we do things and how we authenticate and how we uh, make sure uh, that the that bad people are not being able to get in. So much of resiliency uh, happens to be uh, this uh, need to have some rules and regulations and and standardized processes to do certain things. Yeah, so um, I'd like to ask a question which is a, in a little bit different direction, but I think is really important in 2021 as uh, particularly as engineers, you know, we worry about the technical side of things, but uh, you're, one of your drivers of change related to reducing social inequities. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about where you saw, uh, you know, what you saw as some of the concerns that came up there and how we uh, as engineers should, you know, some things we should be thinking about as we're looking at grid solutions, but also need to consider uh, the social inequities and uh, as we talk more about diversity, equity and inclusion um, across the US right now. You're muted, Jeff. You're muted. I'll start, and then Anu and Anjan can fill in. But um, you know, I think I think one of the one of the things that we recognized as the committee is that um, you know there are solutions out there for people to you know self-generate. You know, you can you can put up your own um, um, generator. You know, either solar or some other technology, and have some storage and you know, maybe be grid connected to help balance it or completely off the grid. You know, there are ways that you can sort of take care of yourself. Uh, but we also recognize that uh, in general, we don't see the grids going away within the time frame that we have in this uh, in this study. You know, just having a community where you have uh, street lights and traffic lights and, you know, commercial and industrial and residential sort of customers um, benefiting from central generation and economies of scale of 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 uh, more uh, cost effective generation as opposed to everybody self generating um, tapping into remote renewables like wind you, you're going to need a grid for that and so so how do you pay for the common infrastructure without putting a uh, disproportionate burden on people that don't um, invest in in other things like local on-site uh, storage and and generation technologies, and and you know because the way that we pay for our infrastructure, it's more of a of a collective way of of gathering up the costs and dividing it in the rate classes, and then and then having the the you know the ratepayers basically share the the cost of this common infrastructure, and if if certain people opt out of that and self generate their own needs, you know then are we disproportionately putting the burden on the rest of the people that can't afford to do that. And so that's really the main part of the social um, justice and social inequities part that we were that we were uh, thinking about from at least from my perspective. Uh, Anu or Anjan, did you have others to add well, from the I'd, I'd like to add that even without the discrepancy between uh, the rich and the poor and uh, the the people who are who have the ability to invest in in something in their homes or whatever uh, there there's the there's the big societal issue that all the all the public utility commissions are are, are really struggling with is that we would like to make things more reliable and more resilient but it's going to cost money and if it costs money that's uh, uh, that means that the rates go up and this is what the public utility commission whose major role is to make sure that the rates are uh, uh, rates are affordable are struggle with i mean how much are you going to let this thing go up and how are you going to then subsidize people who can't afford to pay that those kinds of rates and that's that's going to be an ongoing issue for for uh, as a society I think that sets up very nicely what I wanted to add. So this is the reason why in the, the technology sections we really um, discuss uh, markets. As uh, Jeff and Anjan pointed out, 
a lot of these really have to do with rate structures and this uh, tussle between behind the meter technologies growth and the fact that the, what that means is that the grid is being used as a battery. And so somebody has to pay for it, which means you have the focus shifts to rate structures, which means then the how do you set up the market mechanisms in a way so that all these components are appropriately addressed. So it's also left to the technologists in the audience uh, and the entire technical community to figure out how you can address this uh, trade off and this gap and make sure that that is an equitable solution. There's yeah, a, there's a question up there um, uh, by Asifo uh, about network science, and I, I um, and that that really plays into very well what we were trying to talk about in analytical tools and and so on, and the and to look at it holistically, like you're suggesting, Asifo. Um, that uh, you can't just look at the distribution system on its own. You can't even look at the generation, uh, transmission and distribution system on its own. You've got to bake into it the, all of the uh, software, all of the communication delays, all of the communication structures, which is just another way of saying that you're going to use the net communication networks within the simulation. The, the difficult part, I, I think that we didn't struggle with very much, but said that, well, how are we going to then struggle with the, with the market structures, uh, with, um, uh, you know, different uh, 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 rates of carbonization, those kinds of things, you know, we'll have to probably play with scenarios and Monte Carlo and the rest of it. So that's the technical part. <laughs> and, and again, to add to that, Anjan, so the point that Anjan made about the whole challenge in setting up simulation also is connected with what network science can contribute to because the problem is not just that this is a large scale system this is a large scale system with multiple time scales and increasing time scales with different owners where which means that data while it might be big is not really accessible to everybody so how does network science help in having us understand this interplay might be a good problem Great, thank you. Um, so one last question, um, you know, I think there's a lot of buzz about machine learning and artificial intelligence. You know, I would say network science is part of that. Um, what do you, uh, you know, what do you see as some of the concerns around that and some of the opportunities around uh, those areas? So I'll, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, you know, as researchers, we, we always look at opportunities and there's obviously lots of opportunities of using data science things. What, what is more difficult in my mind is that to get our arms around the data problem itself. That is data science only works if you know what the data is. <laughs> so the question here is where is the data who has the control over the data? Who can get the data? All of those are very, very relevant to the R&D uh, uh, picture. As people who have already tried to do things in this field have, uh, you know, when you go ask somebody to, can I get all your data for the last two years? <laughs> then, uh, you know, suddenly the suddenly you find that this is, there's lots of other kinds of barriers, which is not even technical. Yeah, certainly yeah. ML and AI were discussed. Sorry, Jeff, let me just quickly finish. Um, we're in discussed in the in in the report, and as Anjan mentioned, a lot needs to be unraveled. And it's also part of again a challenge for the technical community to really um, provide a good exposition of what those roles are and why it's an it's a beneficial one. So yeah, and the only thing I'll add is that you know what the committee tried to do was was we recognize that the topics like that are important. We we mentioned all these uh, different types of technologies and things you know related to either AI or modeling or other types of things, but then we backed it up and we looked at what are some of the you know like Andre was talking about data access. You know what are some of the fundamental things that if we had better policies or better um, structures around would unlock some of these potentials um, better. And so that's that's what this committee tried to do in our report is is really 
um, try to focus on more of the fundamental um, enabling things, then it would unleash some of these other innovative things. So no, all you're okay, on mute. Yep. Yeah, okay, I'm unmuted now. So, um, so uh, great. Uh, we're we've run out of time, and um, I want to respect because I know some people have other commitments. But um, you know, I I want to to thank our three panelists uh, first of all for all their efforts to pull together the materials uh, and pull this together. I know this was a a big lift, not only just because of COVID and, and probably lots of online meetings, but also in trying to pull it together and, and then try to disseminate it to help our community. And, uh, you know, I think this is going to be a very important report as we look moving forward, uh, you know, in the future on how this impacted our grid it related to research and related to different activities. So thank you to the, the three of you not only for your time today, but for your time and commitment to help pull this report together. And then last, I'd like to thank our, um, our uh, participants today and great questions. And one of the things, um, and someone put in the chat, is uh, Professor Asifa had his students attend this webinar from Network Science. So, um, so they got to see uh, firsthand some of the applications. And uh, so thank, thanks for, uh, for him uh, getting the students here as well as for uh, their great questions uh, in the uh, in the Q&A uh, that were there. But so, um, so Asif, let us know if you want us to give you some quiz questions for the students. <laughs> uh, there you go. So uh, we probably should have asked that before we started instead of uh, afterwards for the students benefit. But but uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, for the participation. We had almost 100 people on. Um, and so there's obviously a lot of interest in this topic. And um, as I put in the chat, uh, the slides uh, power, uh, the slides, and the uh, video will be up uh, no later than early next week. Um, and uh, so if you have questions, I put Brenna's email in the chat. And she, if you can't find it through the links I put in the chat, um, you can find them, uh, you can talk to Brenna and she can provide those links for you. So uh, thanks so much uh, for a great, great webinar, lots of good information. And um, as a professor, I think this is a great one because it provides a lot of homework for the future um, uh, for all of us that are on, on uh, line here listening and lots of opportunities and I would say job security for many of us and job opportunities for our students that are on. So thank you, everybody. Have a great Thursday. Thank you, our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.